What does God esteem to be the greatest? I mean, he is, but apart from him, the things we're to be growing in, developing down here, what, what does he esteem to be greatest? Love. Let's say together 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And you ever notice in Corinthians 13, the definition of love, verse 4 to 8, in love is faith, faith believes all things, and in love is hope. Love hopes all things. Notice that. Some time ago, the Lord spoke to me and said, give your greatest devotion to that which I esteem to be the greatest. Merle, do you want to spend your life on earth frit fritting away your time or pursuing rabbit trails or just straight on, straight gate, narrow way? His, his priorities, I already knew the answer to that, but we want to be, you know, because one of my jobs as a teacher in the body of Christ is to get you ready. Each one of us has a date. We have a date before the judgment seat of Christ. Am I out of the picture? Uh, if I'm up this far, am I out of the picture? S still on out. Let me know my boundaries here. Each one of us have a date before the judgment seat of Christ. Let's confess together 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good, and we like to put the period there, but it says whether good or bad. And another, also in Romans 14, 10 to 12, he said, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Steve quoted that in Philippians. And it says, so then in Romans 14, 12 says, every one of us, shall give an account of our life to God. Now, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Jesus said that. But that doesn't make him a softy grandfather either. There is the goodness of God and there is the severity of God, Romans eleven twenty two. So that being said, the thing I want to grow in the most is God's love. One time a scribe asked Jesus, Master, what's the great commandment in the law? Mark chapter 12, let's say it together. Jesus said, Hear, O Israel, for the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like unto it. What's the second one, Merv? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said it another way. We call it the gold rule. How does that go, anybody? And all things whatsoever you should, you should that men would do to you. In other words, the way you want men to treat you, do unto them. For he said, this is the law and the prophets. And he said, on these first two commandments, hang or depend all the law and the prophets. So love is the greatest. That's from Moses. God gave that to Moses. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So then Jesus comes along, and in his ministry, John 13, 34, and 35, one, of, one sign of his disciple, let's say it together, we know this, John 13, 34, and 35, he said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Then what does he say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one to another. So the first and greatest command was love God with all your everything. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus said, now a new commandment I give you, and it's love. How is this a new commandment? What he told us in what we just quoted, love your, uh, as, um, you love one another as I have loved you. How is that a new commandment? The first two are love God with every, all your everything. The second is I'm to treat Merle the way I want him to treat me, to love him, my neighbor as myself. So how is this a new commandment that Jesus gave us? That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. As I have loved you, a self-sacrificing pouring out for the other person's betterment. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 6. A self-sacrificial laying down your life 
Does that come naturally to us? I mean, just naturally you want to give up your rights, your time, your money, your efforts your, for other people? David says no. <laughs> Not even for other Christians. That's the neat thing about it because, you know, when you're faced with an, somebody has a need and you know God's pointing his finger on, in your heart, you're, you're to, okay, I had this plan, but I'm going to have to give this up and go over here and help this person. And you're not leaping for joy, let's be honest, in the natural. Maybe you do all the time, okay, let me talk to you afterward and see what you got going on in there. But a time like that, I pray and I say, Lord, okay, I see this as your will. To be honest, I really don't want to do this. But Philippians 2.13 says, you work in me both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Would you just work this in me? And you know what? I've done this very thing. And by the time I'm getting in my car to drive over there to help them do that thing, it's where I, the zeal's working in me, the goodness, the grace. And I go over and do that thing with a joy in your heart, a song in your heart. And guess what? You're going to get a reward on Judgment Day for that, Aaron. And God's going to heap a reward on you for doing that good deed. And you're going to say, Lord, I only did it by your grace. He says, I know, but still you did it. You're going to get a reward. Then we can brag on God and give him the credit. Are we there in Galatians 6? Wait for me till I get there. Verse 2 is, bear one another's burdens. Let's read it together. If we have King James, let's read that together. If you have another one, just read a little quieter. I did this once. Let's all read together. And there was about five translations, and it was just like total chaos. Let's read uh, verse 1 and 2 together, okay? Ready? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There's the law of Christ, is the law of love, is to bear one another's burdens. And one way to do that is verse 1. If a man or if a woman, ladies, you see a woman caught, overtaken in a trespass, caught in a fault, restore such a one. How? Come like this, you need to get your life in order. No, you come from a low position. In the spirit of meekness, you come down in a low position to get down where they're at because they're feeling like dirt anyway. They're, they're, they have the conviction of God on them. They've probably got the condemnation of the enemy on them. They need us to come down just with a low, with meekness and humility and love and help bear that burden, help restore them. Let's go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Let's read together verses 8 to 10, all right? Romans 13, 8 to 10 starts with, oh, no man, anything. Romans 13, verse 8, ready? Oh, no man, anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Let me put a plug in here for memorizing scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, let me ask you a question. You might say, well, Todd, you've got Scripture memorized because, you know, you've got a gift for that. That's not right. I memorize Scripture because I put time into it. Put time into it. Let me ask you a question. If somebody asked you your name, address, telephone number, and Social Security number, would you say, now, wait a minute, i got it written down here somewhere on a piece of paper? You, you could just... Merle, if somebody asked you your wife's name, you know, and, and all these details about your wife before she was married, while she's been married to you, would you have to say, well, hmm, I don't know. You would have all that memorized. It would be in your heart and mind because she's so dear to you. Let me put a plug in for memorizing Scripture. And could I say this? 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, we call that. Verses 4 to 8 describes what love is and what love is not. 
And I really love the, the uh, Amplified Bible when it comes to that portion. You can choose any one you want, but I, could I just really encourage us to memorize 1 Corinthians 3. Hey, you want to do the whole chapter? It's not very long. It's 13 verses. But 4 and 8, 4 through 8 describes what love is and what love is not. I just want to recite that to you now and just listen to this because what's the Greek word for love in 1 Corinthians 13? Agape. And in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, it says, God is love. Anyone but it guess what the Greek word for love is there? God is agape. So could we not say that 1 Corinthians 13, where it says love is this and love is not that, is a revelation of the very nature of God? It says God, love is this and love is that. 1 John 4, verse 8 and 16 says God is love. Let's take it a step further. 2 Peter 1.4 says, if you know, chime in with me, you'll know this. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. By God's exceeding great and precious promises, you, the born-again child of God, they are a partaker of God's very nature, which is divine. What's God's nature? Love. The word partaker there means you are a partner, a sharer, a companion, and an associate with God of his nature, which is divine. Man, I felt so good. I want to say it again. First, 2 Peter 1.4 says you're a partaker of the divine nature. You're a partner, a sharer a companion, and an associate with God of his nature, which is divine, and God is love. So God's nature, which is love, he is love. He doesn't have love, he is love. That's your new nature. But you know, is it an automatic done deal that we walk in love every day, David? What, do, what else do we got going on here? We're made of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. What else do we need to do? Adam wants to show up, or we could say it this way, we need to crucify the flesh. That old man, the body of sins, crucified with Christ, but we've got the flesh to crucify. We have the mind to do what? Renew. We have the world to come out from and be separate. And who's the adversary of our souls? The tempter. We submit to God, receive his grace, resist the devil, and he flees. So now 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8 in the Amplified goes like this. This is God's nature, and since you're born again, you are a partaker of God's very nature, which is divine. This is your new nature. It goes like this. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious or boils over with jealousy. Hmm. Envy is the green monster. Love is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. In other words, I'm better than you are. Not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. Love is not conceited, arrogant, inflated with pride. Doesn't have an inflated ego. Love is not rude and unmannerly, does not act unbecomingly. Love is not touchy, 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 fretful or resentful, Watch this. Love takes no account of the evil done to it, pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Proverbs 12, 16 says, a prudent man covers shame. He ignores an insult and conceals dishonor. That takes, like Steve was preaching, that takes death to self to walk in that, to ignore an insult, to conceal dishonor. Well, there's a time Jesus said, when your brother trespasses against you, go to him and tell his fault, his fault to him. Here's one. How are we doing with this next one? Love does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it's not self-seeking. Hmm. You married folk in here, is that an easy one to work out? Love does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it's not self-seeking. Seems to me, Jonas, that cross needs to be taken up in the marriage, doesn't it? That's the first place for you married, us, you who are married. Love does not insist on its own rights or its own way, 
for it's not self-seeking. But you know what we do as, as born-again children of God? We insist on God's rights. We insist on God's way. We insist on God's will be done in our life and to do his will. Love does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Now let's say the last part together. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. There's something, if we abide in Jesus and he abides in us and we walk the love walk, you'll never fail, David. You'll never fail, you'll never stumble, you'll never fall. But you'll walk it from victory to victory to victory. 2 Corinthians 2.14 will come to pass in your life, which he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the fragrance of his knowledge by you in every place. Let's now go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's read verse 22 together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Ready? 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Seeing... You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Unfeigned love. What does that mean, unfeigned? Anybody? Not pretending? Anybody else? Unfeigned? Michael? Sincere, yes. It means sincere and without hypocrisy. One of Jesus' favorite words for the religious people of his day started with an H. What did he call them? Hypocrites. That seemed to be his favorite word for his own religious Jewish people of the day. Now, there were true, true believers in there. Hypocrite is I'm pretending to be something on the outside to you, and I'm living another lifestyle behind where you, you don't see me. We're to, I'm to be in secret what I want to portray to you in public. We're to love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now turn over to chapter 4. Verse 7 and 8. Chapter 4, are we ready? Verse 7 and 8, let's read. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Eight, and above all things have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Notice twice Peter says we're to love one another with a pure heart fervently. We touched on this earlier. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot do this in my own strength. I've proven that time and time again. I am well aware of that. I'm well acquainted with myself. I cannot do this in my own strength. Lord, it's got to be you loving through me. Uh, Romans 5.5 5 says the love of God has been shed abroad or poured forth in your heart by the Holy Ghost who's given unto you. You know, that's the neat thing about this. The truly blessed man or blessed woman is the one that they know they're weak. They know without Christ that you're nothing and you can do nothing. But with Christ, there's nothing that you cannot do because you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. It's two sides of that coin. I, I mentioned this in our last meeting. Merle, would you say it's true that I should have absolutely no self-confidence? I guess you'll have to define that so I know how to answer it. <laughs> Anybody, what, is it true that I, as a born-again child of the Most High God, should absolutely have no self-confidence whatsoever? Let's ask the preacher who preceded me. He was teaching on this topic. Steve, what do you say? Put it to death and bury it. No self-confidence in the sense of, God, I don't need you, I can do this. Would we as Christians ever do that? We might not say it, but we ever act that way? Oh, yeah, we can do that a lot. But it's like this, Lord, apart from you, I know nothing, I can do nothing, I am nothing. But apart from you, but with you, I'm your child. I'm actually your favorite child, 
In the New Testament, elect, election, elected in the Greek means chosen, selected, and favorite. That means if you're born again, you're God's favorite son and you're God's favorite daughter, very favorite. God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. So, Father, with you, I'm your favorite son. With you, I, I, I don't have the wisdom. Give me your wisdom. I don't have the ability. Give me your ability. And you know what? As you do that, you, through him and he by you, are going to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Christine, the poems God has given you, did it come out of your own intellect? It came from, you were inspired, you felt by the Holy Spirit to write some very beautiful pieces that have inspired many. That's a truly blessed man or woman is one who knows that apart from you, Lord, I am nothing, I know nothing, and I can do nothing. But with you, I'm your favorite child. With you, I can do all things. And with you, you can give me wisdom that's way beyond me. Now, let's finish up in 1 John Chapter 4, and I'm going to bring this to a close. How many in here would like to live this life without fear? Now, fears will come from the outside. Fear is a spirit. Let's say 2 Timothy 1, 7 together. Instead of saying, for God has not given us, say, God has not given me. Ready? For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, fear is a spirit. It's a demonic spirit. God hasn't given you that spirit, but he's given you the spirit of power, his power, his love, and a, having the mind of Christ. Can you have a, even any more sound mind than that? You got the mind of Christ. And we need to think with his mind. So how many in here would like to live in freedom over fear? As a matter of fact, walking in dominion over fear in this life. And let, how many in here would like to have boldness in the day of judgment? In the day of judgment, when each one of us stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for our life, that you'll be able to stand before him boldly. That doesn't mean brashly with an attitude, but there's a boldness, there's a lack of fear, there's full confidence. Let's take a look. He's given us an avenue to do just those two things. Okay, we're in 1 John 4. Let's read 16 to 18 together. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. Ready? And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's boldness in the day of judgment. Next one is fear-free living. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So notice in 16, halfway through God is love. Here's the key. He that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Verse 17, you do this, your love will be made perfect, meaning it will grow and mature and come to full maturity. This perfect love will cast out fear. And also, as you devote yourself to live this way on the earth, and don't get under a, perform a yoke of a performance mentality. None of us are going to walk this perfect, but... Also, don't use as an excuse to indulge the flesh and not walk in love. But as we seek to walk in love in this life, love God with all your everything. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, in there you are to love yourself. There is a proper love of self and an improper love of self. God's love, all the while God dwells in you. You're, you're his very temple that he dwells in you. And you have his nature his love is going to be growing and maturing and perfecting in you, which will cast out fear. And also on judgment day, it shall be well with you. You'll stand before Jesus, the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, to give an account for your life, and you'll be able to stand there with boldness. And I'm going to stop right there. Jonas, I'm finished.